theme of this year's uh, conference is, social, is America versus socialism. Can you explain for us what the relationship between communism and socialism is? Yes, well, communism is actually a term that predates socialism. And they really share the same core principles, although there are many different manifestations of socialism, many different speeds of socialism, many different schools of socialism, you know, different countries have different schools, Fabian socialism, Gramscian socialism, communism, but they all have the same core principles. They're all essentially materialistic, atheistic. They, they see society in terms of evolution, that we're evolving in, towards a more perfect society between quotes, and they're all radically egalitarian, meaning they see equality as the supreme value against which everything is to be measured. It's the one and the, the first and only commandment, if you will, of uh, of of, so, of of communism. Social is equality. Equality is justice and morality is measured by the degree that it promotes equality in every form. And because equality does not seem like an inherently bad principle, it actually seems, on the surface, it seems quite balanced. So why is it not a, a helpful principle? Well, that's a good question because there is a certain degree of leg real equality between people. You know, we have certain fundamental rights that are equal. We all share the same human nature. And from that human nature stems uh, our certain fundamental rights, the right to life, the right to accumulate property, the right to constitute a family, and so forth. There are, there are fundamental rights, but other than that, our, our accidents, the, the, the attributes that we have are, are fundamentally different. We all have different capacities, different degrees of intelligence, of, of ability, to, of leadership skills, of uh, male and female, of course, very different very different functions, each beautiful and unique in human society, and socialism and communism both see that as an evil that must be eliminated. And by eliminating those, those inequalities, we accelerate the evolution of society towards an ever more perfect utopian vision of society. In effect, it's actually trying to reduce or to uh, wipe out the natural diversity and the natural order that has, that you said, in, in your understanding, is just fundamental to human and to hum, humanity and to nature. Right. What you seem to be saying is that in an attempt to make society more just and more fair by making a, a common standard, an even line, it's actually very intolerant towards the natural diversity of human life. The way, the, way, the, way we, the way we look at it, the way, I, the way I see it, is God created the universe with fundamental inequalities. And those are not unjust, those are actually legitimate, very legitimate. Between, uh, you have, you have uh, different inequalities in the natural order, you know, in, in, even in the mineral kingdom. You, know, you have diamonds and granite, you know, but one doesn't oppress the other. They both have their own unique qualities, and that's a good thing. And thank God for that, you know. And same thing with uh, with with human society. You have great men and women who have exceptional leadership abilities, and you have others who have less. But those complement each other, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's legitimate. And socialism seeks to eradicate those based on a false notion of justice. A false notion that inequality is unjust in itself and must be eliminated. So you have more property, well, that's wrong. That my neighbor has a larger farm than I do, you know, or or has more money than I do, or more ability than I do, you know, and and that taken to its final consequences leads to this radical transgenderism, that gender theory, that wants to impose this radical elimination of even biological distinctions between male and female. And so now we're seeing, you know, teenage boys and girls transition between quotes from male to female. And if you even voice, uh, op just ex voice opposition to that, you're considered evil, you know, hateful. 
and you are persecuted. And there are even professors, teachers who have lost their jobs because of just voicing concern over, over that. So it's really a totalitarian ideology that may not directly affect every American now, but it will very shortly as it filters through our education system, through our government, through our laws, and and it will fu it's fundamentally transforming America before our eyes, and we have to wake up to that and resist it because it's it's they're going for they're going for the jugular of American society, and we need to stop that. Can you talk from your perspective about um, you touched on it a bit, but how the inequalities in society are from perhaps a spiritual perspective, actually a really wonderful thing. Well, you have, uh, you have wonderful examples of, of great heroes through history, of great men and women who showed leadership qualities, who showed courage and virtue. Uh, you need, there are many examples in American history, George Washington, uh, General Douglas, uh, Douglas MacArthur, for example. Um, you have great, great heroes who of course, military heroes are always a very good example. In, in European history, Joan of Arc is a good example, one of my favorite examples of a, of a, of a good female character. Um, and they, they, were, they showed exceptional character, virtue, but they're unique. You know, if everyone, it's not possible for everyone to have the same, the same character, the same, the same, to show the same virtue, but that, they're examples for the rest of society to imitate and to follow. And it, it just doesn't function, society can't function if everyone is equal. You have, in a family, you have parents over, the, over children. In a, in a classroom, you have a teacher who teaches students. So the teacher is the leader of this he, teacher, he or she, uh, necessarily requires an authority, needs an authority over the, over the students to teach them. In government, it's legitimate for there to be government authorities, for there to be judges. Uh, 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 statesmen, you know, who rule over society. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Of course, if those leaders are corrupt, that's of course a bad thing, but the authority in itself is not bad, it's not wrong. Um, and, and to subvert that order, it, it harms everyone. It harms all, because you have anarchy, you have chaos, and, and really I think part, a large part of our, of our crisis today stems from that lack of that, that, that radical equality that is being imposed on everything. We are in a very divided time politically. I feel like part of that is connected to this, I, the ideology of struggle that is, is so key to communism and also socialism. Sure, yeah, the, the uh, of course class struggle is, is, a, is inherent to communism and uh, they always try to provoke class struggle. So. They always try to provoke, you know, the haves and the have-nots uh, to fight and, to, to, and to, to just try to destroy each other. And uh, that, of course, is a, is a false concept of history. They see it, the, as Marx said, the, the history of humanity is heretofore the history of class struggle, right? So it was Marx who is the or originator of this idea that history is a narrative of the oppress oppressor versus right. the oppressed. That comes from Marx. That's very important for people to understand because this is commonly taught now in our university. Right. And he took that class struggle and mixed it with materialism, right? And he created the dialectical materialism, Marx, just classical Marxist uh, sociology. Uh, that continues today. You know, you have, I think one of the goals of Antifa is to provoke uh, a, uh, a new class warfare, right? The, the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Antifa movement, uh, continues today that spirit of struggle and uh, as conservatives we I believe we need to of course denounce that and not ourselves fall into it I think there's a, a, a good number of even conservative Americans who see our fight today in terms of a struggle of a class struggle I'm the first one to denounce corruption and even treason in Washington, the deep state, you know, the, the, the swamp, whatever you want to call it. But we should be careful not to fall into a spirit of struggle, that we are in, we are members of a class, the deplorables, let's say, 
and against trying to overthrow another class. That concept of struggle, class struggle, is, is essentially a socialist, communist concept. And, and that's very important because I see it both on the conservative side and the liberal side. People have, the, the ideology is strong, can be strong on both sides and they can see the other side as the enemy. But it's most, the majority of people, I think, having known both liberals and, and conservatives are good people. Um, and actually, if you get down to the core values, you know, I think most of us, we want to be able to have our freedom. We want to be able to own property and to do what we want to with that property. But we have this great divide in society because we have, be, because we've given in to this notion of struggle, that, that's, that somehow we have to fight these people, but it's actually the ideas. It's not so much a difference in ideology, but just a, who wants to go more radically to apply them. Karl Marx said that socialism, can, that communism, in the, in the Communist Manifesto, he wrote, communism can be reduced to a single sentence, the abolition of private property. And that's not just land, you know, real estate and so forth. That's every form of mine and thine. Everything that, the very notion of, in, of an individual owning something, whether it be land, whether it be a family, whether it be a spouse, marital rights between spouses, uh, that all must be abolished. So uh, for Americans in the United States, historically the socialists were very careful about attacking property because Americans have a very healthy attachment to property. You know, you, but that's weakening, that's going away. And more and more through the Green New Deal, for example, through all this environmentalism, we see a, an attack on land rights, on private property, that is the fulfillment ultimately of Marx's vision of a classless society where the state would own all means of production, um, if not the federal government, uh, some kind of a collective of some sort would own and control, but if not in law, uh, in practice. Because many, many young people now, and people in college, they believe that they support socialism, um, probably without fully understanding what it is. One element of it is that it's, it sounds noble. It sounds like it's helping, and it sounds like it's helping everyone. Right, and, and uh, you see a, a great turning away from religion in the 20th century, right? And that's not because people are less religious. Human nature is the same. We're naturally religious beings. You know, we have a thirst for God, for the absolute, for an authority to tell us what is right and what is wrong. We have a, almost an in, inbred desire for that, right? And what happened in the 20th century was most churches became liberal. And by liberal, they became relativistic, right? So you can do whatever you want. There is no real truth, absolute, you know, there's no, you can, of course, the sexual revolution was a big part of that. People turned away from the main, the main line, churches, cross churches, uh, many sectors of the Catholic Church, I'm Catholic, many of them became very liberal um, after the 60s. And people turned away from traditional, but they didn't become less religious. And what we're seeing now is people thirsting for an absolute, they're thirsting for principles that are rock solid. They're, they're, they're thirsting for absolute movement to follow that has that, that takes its principles to its their final consequences. And, and also that you can be part of that gives your life deeper meaning because exactly. I think we many of us want that as well. Thirst for meaning, absolutely. And the uh, the radical politicians today are performing that. They're they're fulfilling that that void. They're filling that void that was left by the, the Christian religion when it abandoned basically the field in the, in the 20th century. So I believe that what we're seeing, the radicalization, the polarization of American politics is not a political polarization or an economic one, but it's more of a religious polarization. With communism and socialism being a religion. Absolutely. Filling them. Yeah, it's, it's, it performs kind of a religious function. And most Americans, of course, aren't, or a lot of Americans anyway, aren't 
one way or the other. You know, most Americans are, many are still very much kind of in the center, maybe center left or center right. But they're being pulled in one direction or the other. And being pulled in one direction, I think you can know that their, their principles ultimately sip, go in, in one direction or the other. And, and people are, are being, are, some people are actually quite scared by that fact that they're, this is where our ideas lead. It leads to, to this, uh, the, the Kavanaugh hearing I think was a very good example of where our politics is going. And you have a situation where reason, facts, logic, is no longer no longer has any meaning or any importance in the debate. It's it's kind of a clash of of, of two religions. At the same time, I think it's a, it shows a weakness on the part of the, of the of socialism and communism because they've attracted a lot of people, but they have not been able to persuade the majority of society. I mean, look what happened in, in Britain. You know, with the with the election there with Jeremy Corbyn, he lost in a landslide not only because of his, he was a poor candidate, but the left is no longer able to persuade like they, like they used to, you know, the, like, they, like they did in the 20s or 30s or even 50s and 60s. In the 60s, there was a, a charge, you know, kind of a real attraction on the part of the, the, the hippies, the, the sexual revolution, the, the Berkeley revolution, of campus, man, you know, protests and all that. And, who among the left, who is like the front, the, the charismatic leader who's like persuading people to, to become liberal? The really like hardcore Bernie people, maybe 10, 20% of the country, maybe. Maybe 20% 20, 20 at most, I would say. And it's one thing for people to say they're socialist, but when you go to them and say, okay, are you willing to, uh, do away with your gas-powered car? Are you willing to do away with natural gas heating in your house? Like New York State now, uh, New York State is no longer, some utilities are no longer hooking up new uh, houses with gas because of pipeline constrictions, because Governor Cuomo decided to cancel, to veto any new natural gas pipelines in New York State. The city of Berkeley banned natural gas for all new con housing construction in Berkeley. California? Or? Cal Berkeley, California. Oh, Berkeley, uh -huh. California. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a trend now. You know, they're kind of implementing the, are, are people ready for that? How many Americans are really ready to give up their, their cars, their uh, inexpensive food, uh, their you know, air transportation, gas, natural gas heating? Very few, I would say are willing to do that. So, One misconception is that communism was a political system, but it's actually a, a totalitarian ideology. I think, uh, yeah, communism is usually, you know, the, the books on communism in a library are usually put in the economics section, right? But it's actually quite uh, only one small part. It's a communist, uh, economics is only one of many facets and it's really an all-encompassing ideology so one sociologist I remember reading about who, who, who termed it how socialism and communism are wage war on human nature so they see human nature and they want to re-engineer human nature to create a, 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 a an egalitarian utopia a totally egalitarian they want to make a new man the Russians actually had the, the term the new Soviet man Right? A, a new man who was completely atheistic, materialistic, who imbibed the or incorporated the, the philosophy of socialism entirely. You know, that, that's a religion. You know, that's not a that's not an economics school. Right, because it's important to know that historically, when communism comes into a country, it's not just politics. It it controls the art. It controls thought. It controls every aspect of a person's life. It's it's far more than economics, but Many people just don't see that. Don't see that, yeah. They they don't see that, and it's uh, it's we're seeing that now with I I believe uh, gender theory, feminism, you know the the Me Too movement. They're really ways to essentially allow a totalitarian takeover of the most intimate of relations, which is between male and female.
in society. It's happening in Lafayette, Louisiana, you know, and Oklahoma City, and uh, and our group is fighting it. Actually, we're fighting. Uh, let's say uh, you know the the Germans and the Japanese in World War II. You know, there's an enemy that is going to destroy us, and we need to fight back to save our society. It's fundamentally different from a, a communist notion of struggle, which is where struggle is inherent to reality. Everything is struggle. Everything is class struggle. And only by waging class struggle can there become, can there can progress be made and the evolution of history advance, which is a very different uh, notion of, of, of struggle. The idea that we have to struggle against people in our own country. One of the things that, that um, I find so horrible about socialism and communism is that it basically creates a hell on earth. So everything is always fight. There's always, they're always inflaming tensions, inflaming confusion and dis dispute, dis discord, disrupting and cr crushing, destroying uh, harmony and peace in society. And that's, that's uh, it's, it's really just hellish, you know. But for, why? Because they, they hate human society as it is. They hate, uh, the universe, the, the created universe as, as God made it. Many people feel very uncomfortable with our current president and they feel like you touched on the Trump dysphoria is a, is a real condition. People are really suffering from hatred and fear of our president and uh, that's a terrible state for a person to have to live in um, but it's also not necessary. I, I support many if not all or almost all the policies of our president but uh, I think conservatives have to be very careful not to be a, a foil for this struggle, this spirit of struggle, the spirit of class struggle that the left is inflaming all the time. And so we need to fight liberalism, fight socialism, fight communism. But not make friends with the people. But not artificially <laughs> inflame tensions unnecessarily, right? We want to destroy the enemy. We want to fight the enemy. We don't want to encourage the breakup of, uh, of, of society along the lines of a, of, a, of a class struggle. You know, we want to destroy the enemy, especially defeat the ideology of the enemy. I'm referring more to like the radical leaders, you know, oh, who are okay. the more, yeah. not, not the average person, the direction of society, which way it's going to go, was always determined by small minorities on one side or the other. You know, you look at uh, the birth of Christianity, it was a tiny minority. It started with 12, you know, who went out and evangelized the Roman Empire. You, know, you look at uh, the French Revolution, a very small number of revolutionaries who uh, subverted and destroyed the monarchy and killed a million people, uh, ultimately, in, in France during the French Revolution. Same thing with the, 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 the takeover of Russia, the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were a minority of a minority. I mean, just just tiny number. But they were radical, they were organized, and they were successful because it's, minor, it's radical minorities that affect change, for good or for evil. So we need to be, for the good side, dedicated, organized, radical, and very, uh, very serious and but uh, we will win in the end. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. So, truth will win. And I think that also speaks to the, the power of the divine and that we all have that spark.